is tegenwoordig ook zo makkelijk. Wat zijn de dingen die, uh, die je net mist omdat je even nadenkt? Uh, ja. Dat is een standaard recording. Zo. Ja. Uh, recording. Ja. Oké. Okay. Ja. Okay. Can I have a mic? I don't yeah. know. So, uh, yeah. Exactly, these nodes are connected to be able to produce this type of behavior. 
up regulation, now we change down regulation. This is a big question. So uh, this is what we were trying to investigate. Uh, and of course you can see it and you can draw on the paper, uh, the network connectivity, and you can think through what kind of outcome you expect from gene one. But there are so many possibilities that it's uh, easier, of course, to use computational approach, to use your computer to simulate this network uh, with your computer instead of just paper uh, and hands. So, um, the first aim in this study was to create a framework that allows you to exhaustively simulate this type of behavior, exhaustively uh, enumerate all of the possible networks, all of the possible connectivity between just uh, three nodes in this three nodes in this network. And then we were aiming to investigate properties of those patterns that are appearing as a result of this uh, simulation. And we were also interested in combinations of the patterns, and that's why we introduced uh, the force gene, gene 2, force node gene 2. Gene 2 can also show epistatic behavior, and it can actually influence on behavior of gene 1. And the last but not least, we were aiming to find the mechanistic explanation for the patterns. So again, what's hidden behind this question mark? To be able to do that, to be able to simulate this type of behavior, we created a modeling scheme with uh, three levels. On the first level, we create Boolean matrices. So you can imagine four nodes uh, that can be also represented as adjacency matrix. We have zero when the nodes are disconnected and one when the nodes are connected. So we generated all of the possible uh, combinations of those zeros and ones in these matrices. And you see here uh, the corresponding network to this matrix. On the second level, uh, we generated all the possible weighted matrices. Weighted means we add weights to these edges. So previously it was just one and zero, and now we generate all the possible combinations with four types of connectivities. First is number one, it's a weak activation. Second is five, it's strong activation. Third is one minus one, it's weak inhibition, and force is minus five, is weak uh, as well as inhibition. So we generated all of the possible uh, combinations of ones and five, minus ones and minus five, so the place one we have one here. And that is how we came up with weighted matrices. And on the third level, we added uh, even a bit more details, it's called Petronet models. I won't go into details how Petronet works, but in brief, uh, we have the network, uh, which is also, uh, well, this network is a convenient mathematical formalism, and it, and it is also a graph. And on this network, we simulate the dynamic behavior of some real network in real life. Uh, so in, in our case, the genetic networks. And we do that by putting tokens in uh, nodes, and moving token from one node to another node, through so-called transitions. These are transitions. And again, the edges are weighted. So we have uh, one, minus one, one, minus five, five. Um, I don't have enough time to explain how exactly we uh, uh, switched from weighted matrices to Petronet models, but uh, the major idea behind it is that for one weighted matrices, we can have up to 16 Petronets. So you can imagine if you have four nodes and if you have four type of uh, um, yeah you have four nodes and you have um, sixteen possible edges and two in the power of sixteen two because we have zero and ones two in the power of sixteen will result in sixty five thousand boolean matrices boolean models it's already a lot right and if you move from boolean models to your uh, weighted matrices. You might end up with 5 to the power of 16, so 153 billion models. Already a lot. And then if you uh, go then to Petronet levels from weighted models, you will have 2.5 trillion models. Well, that's a big number, right? So you see that combinatorial explosion is happening, and um, it's not feasible to go this way, right? Of course, we might simulate this or 2.5 trillion models, like wait for five years of simulation and then try to analyze these results, but it's too, too difficult, too hard. So it's no way to go, uh, and we need to come up with a clever way, more clever way to approach this uh, 
from Bloom. And we did filtering. We thought that if we involve uh, filtering as much as possible, then we might be able to decrease our possible uh, amount of possible networks to simulate and then to analyze. So on the first level, on the level of Boolean matrices, we decided that we do not allow self edges, so there is no possibility that regulator is connected to itself or gene is connected to itself. We allow only two maximum incoming edges to each of the nodes, and we thought that both regulators, R1 and R2, should be connected to genes, otherwise this network is not uh, uh, showing any kind of epistatic behavior, it's not possible. So, this is how we filter it on the first step. On the second step, we filter it the symmetry. So, what is symmetry? You can imagine that if you exchange regulators, uh, regulator 2 and regulator 1 with places and uh, their corresponding connectivity as well, if you exchange the places uh, for G1 and G2, and both of them together, you will see completely the same models. They just rotate it, mirror it, and they will show completely the same behavior. And it doesn't make sense to run them and then to analyze them. We have four type of models that are showing the same behavior. Then we can just filter three and leave only one of them. That is what we did on the second level. And on the third level, we restricted the amount, uh, the amount of possibilities how to come from weighted matrices to patronet models. Again, I won't go into details here. And the last but not least, again, we filter it even more symmetry. Uh, involved in this uh, simulation scheme and modeling scheme. We also filtered some unstable models, so you can imagine that if you simulate the same model several times, uh, the same model can show different type of behavior. We call it unstable and we filter it that way. We are not interested in those unstable models. And we also filtered some rare patterns. Rare both on the level of the gene expression data from a previous study of some HCTL, and rare also on the simulation level. So that is how we jumped from 2.5 trillion models to just 9.2 million patronets. And we consider that they are representing all biologically relevant 3 and 4 nodes genetic networks. This was already a big achievement in terms of number of models, right? So we separated our analysis scheme also on three levels. So on the first level we were trying to investigate whether Boolean models are already enough to see epistatic behavior. So, do we even need weighted matrices and patronets here? That is what the question we were trying to ask, to answer. So, you see here two plots. On the left side, you see a um, uh, number of topologies, so-called topologies, so the number of all possible uh, unique topologies, unique network connectivity per pattern. And on the right-hand side, you see the number of patronets per each pattern. What you can directly spot on these plots, we have inversion here, and inversion is the least abundant pattern among all. It means that inversion is already hard to get on the theoretical level. The second thing that you can spot from these plots is that topology does not directly correlate with the number of patronets. So you see here the number of topologies, 705, 600 something, 600, blah, blah, blah. And on the right hand side, you see that number of patronets does not really correlate with these numbers, right? So it means that topology is probably not enough to get the epistatic pattern. And if it's not just a network connectivity, if it's not just a Boolean matrix, what else? What else can do epistasis, can, can lead to epistatic behavior? The second level was weighted matrices, right? So this was the second level of analysis. We were trying to investigate whether added weights, uh, number of minus five and five, so weak inhibition or strong activation, can lead to epistatic behavior and how exactly. Uh, here you see two plots. I put buffering for comparison here. Uh, on the left side you see inversion. So on x-axis uh, you see the number of uh, possible uh, connections in the network. So for example, in this network we see four edges and then it's number four over here. And on the y-axis, you see the number of possible strong connections. So uh, in this network, minus 5 is a strong connection, and this network has only one edge with a number minus 5. It means that this network will be over here, counted over here. So uh, what we were trying to answer is, is strong connection really important for inversion or buffering or any other pattern? Again, what you can directly spot on this plot, Sorry. 
that the minimum number of connections for inversion pattern is three. For the other pattern, the situation is different. For buffering, you can get a uh, buffering already with just two edges. For inversion, it's not possible. And it was actually a bit of a surprise that you can get inversion with just three connections. We thought that four is necessary. Um, the second thing that you can directly spot on these plots is that you have only few, mo uh, only few mo uh, models in inversion with all strong or weak, all weak edges. So, you do not see this uh, on this plot probably, it's uh, highlighted, but probably not that clear. So, only few with all strong edges or only few with all weak edges. And for buffering, the situation is very different. You see that uh, it's possible to get buffering with all weak or all strong edges. What does it mean? That a combination of strong and weak edges is really important for inversion to appear. It's really important for this pattern. And then, on the third level, on the patronet level, for inversion to remind you, uh, to remind you we have 165,000 models. How can you analyze this? How can you come up with a reasonable conclusion on the base of it? You can uh, try to generalize these models somehow, right? So 165,000 models. So what we were trying to do, we were trying to come up with a way to see so-called core networks or prototypes. Uh, and try to come up with a way to see those core networks or prototypes in all of the possible patronets for inversion, delineate them, and uh, figure out if they can generalize the inversion pattern. So this is the example of one of the core networks. You see the connectivity between three nodes over here. And this is the same connectivity in other patronets with just uh, more added co connections, but basically this is probably the same model. This is probably the same heroes with extra edges. So we call it prototypes or core networks, and we were trying to use, see how many of those prototypes we have in inversion. And to remind you, we have uh, several inversion flavors. This is the result, this is one of the prototypes for um, uh, one of the inversion flavors. You see here that it's characterized by uh, inhibition between regulators, regulator 1 and regulator 2, strong activation from regulator 2 to G1, and weak activation from regulator 1 to G1. And to remind you again, the difference between edges, uh, the between strands edges, is very important for inversion patterns. So you see here, strong edges appearing. So, um, on the right hand side, you see the type of symmetry that we were not able to track. And the type of symmetry that we are able to track only by hands, not computationally. So, uh, you see here that this edge between regulates 2 and gene 1 over here is just directed through the force gene, or this edge is just directed again through the force gene. This is a type of symmetry that is incredibly hard to track computationally. But you see it by hands when you start analyzing those models. So on the basis of this analysis, on the basis of this prototype analysis, uh, we can generalize mechanisms that actually occur in real life. This is all a theoretical simulation on computers, right? But uh, eventually, you would like to see that in real biology example. This is what we try to do. This is what uh, has been done by Patrick Hammond lab uh, in Utrecht. They were trying to map our theoretical result, uh, this one was a real biological example in GSTF's data set from 2015, the previous study. And uh, they have found that genes uh, GLN3 and GET1, Saccharomyces reduce are, um, GLN3 is inhibiting GET1, and they are differentially regulating nuclear encoded mitochondrial respiratory genes. So this was already a big thing to find. We can confirm that our theoretical solution space can be found in real biological example. This is the other example that I found uh, for four networks, for four node networks with four uh, edges, uh, where the genes are being 4 and HEC1 um, are regulated PDR5, PDR15, and PDR3 gene that is shown buffering here is strongly activating those genes, PDR5 and PDR15, and those genes are involved in um, uh, yeah, the, the uh, antibiotics resistance. So the take-home message would be that uh, we can evaluate 
9.2 million models that are represented by logically relevant subsets of uh, trillions of models and that we can see epistatic behavior in our uh, computer simulation. Actually, only 25% of models were not interacting, were not showing any epistatic behavior, and all the others were. And uh, we show that we can extract reasonable and novel biological insights on the base of computer simulation. We show that for inversion, a combination of strong and, strong and weak edges is crucial. And we show it also that we can generalize mechanisms uh, for uh, sub patterns on the prototype analysis. And our framework may be further used for um, other genetic networks or our data set that we generate can be also used for further analysis because we were mostly concentrated on inversion but we have more patterns, right? And the difficulties that we needed to overcome in these projects are, first of all, huge amounts of possible networks, so it involved a lot of filtering, and we needed to come up with a way, with the best way of filtering those models. For, uh, the second point is that the symmetry hugely impeded the data analysis, and we were able to track only partially uh, the symmetry issue, and some symmetry issues were still in the data. And the third, uh, that even with lots of the filtering involved, it's still hard to mine the data because we have lots of parameters in our network scheme, lots of uh, things to investigate. And again, oh, we have analyzed all the inversion, and we have three more pattern, patterns to go, and they are even more complicated because inversion has, uh, uh, was the, mo the least abundant among all the patterns. And here is the time for questions. What do you mean under the visualization? Like what, how it's fired exactly? Yeah, we've done some. Um, I wrote a small tool, which is never used. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I wrote a small tool to show how network is firing, but this is. Uh, yeah, this was just a minor part. This was seven months internship, started with three months and then prolongated for longer and longer. At some moment, we just needed to stop, right? Yes. What kind of tools did you use to generate uh, the models? Yeah, it was. Um, um, we started with a tool written by Annika Jakobsen, the former PhD student. It's uh, not that difficult to write Petronet simulation tool. There are plenty of them available on the internet as well, but we needed something really specific. We needed something to be able to run on uh, servers, on uh, clusters. So we wrote our own tool for running this uh, simulation process. And it, it's not that difficult to uh, run Petronet. Uh, yeah, it was Python. And the analysis was in our. Of assigning patterns, you mean? Or unstable. Yeah, so we run the simulation five times, and if uh, one of the models was different in terms of episodic behavior, we thought that this model is already unstable. And we filtered them away. Of course, it's, it would be an interesting question to investigate uh, the properties of those unstable models and why they are unstable. Yes. Uh, you said that. 25, uh, for 25 percent, the models uh, there's no interaction. Yeah. Um, would it make sense to leave those out? And if there's a way, is there a way to do so? Um, basically, you are assigning patterns after you simulate the model, so you don't know from the beginning whether it's going to be able to show epistemic behavior or not. And uh, yeah, I will be curious to learn <laughs> how exactly to filter them away from the beginning. But, um, yeah, you have 25%, uh, skip that one. You have 25%, which is not showing any epistatic behavior. Uh, it's two million models. 
It's two million models and it's 703 topologies. We don't know how exactly to characterize them, nobody investigated it. Yeah, we don't have time for that. Deep yeah. effort for that. But it would be an interesting question. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, the paper is uh, on the review. <laughs> And the second paper has been written, the manuscript has been written and has not been sent yet, but uh, I hope in one year or so <laughs> it will be possible to read this articles to them.